Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, Rice University's Baker Institute. We're delighted to have you with us for this special event. Uh, we're, we're currently celebrating our 20th anniversary uh, and highlighting our policy research programs on energy, health, science, and foreign affairs. So if I can put in a plug for the Institute, if you're interested in learning more about our work, because I know there's people here who uh, are not members of our roundtable, we have contact cards out uh, which you can fill uh, when you leave. I want to personally thank the directors of the three presidential libraries. Uh, for organizing uh, tonight's event. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Texas Tribune for their sponsorship of our panel uh, discussion uh, this evening as the first of a three-part multi-city series entitled Lone Star Treasures, the Presidential Libraries of uh, Texas. Uh, it is fitting, of course, that Texas has become the first state with three presidential libraries. That's quite a, uh, a record clear recognition of the state's enormous contribution to leading the nation at the highest level of our country, especially in the past half century. Uh, the mission of the Presidential Library in general encompasses three goals. First, to preserve and make available the history of the particular president. Second, to enrich public understanding of the presidency and foster a spirit of public service. And third, to provide educational uh, resources and activities on important issues of public policy. Uh, the Baker Institute is truly proud to be linked uh, with the three libraries, both by the historical connection of our foundational figures and also in the core mission of building on the vision of those great American leaders in a university setting. Uh, we look forward to finding new opportunities for collaborative work uh, to accomplish these goals in Houston and Texas and on the broader regional and uh, national stage. So let me introduce tonight's distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Mark uh, Updegrove is the, uh, if you want to come up while I, so people will, is the director of the LBJ Library. He's uh, the director of the oldest library, but you can see he's the youngest person. <laughs> <laughs> Must be some connection there. Uh, Mark joined the library in 2009 after a career as an author, lecturer, journalist, and publisher with Newsweek and Time Magazine in Canada and Los Angeles. Uh, during his tenure at Time Magazine, he developed a multimedia traveling exhibit called Time and the Presidency, profiling American presidents from FDR to Clinton. Uh, currently, he is managing a multi-million dollar redesign of the library's core exhibits on Lyndon Johnson and his times. <clears throat> Mark has authored three books on the American presidency, Indomitable Will, LBJ in the Presidency, Baptism by Fire, Eight Presidents Who Took Office in Times of Crisis. I've read that book. And Second Acts, Presidential Lives and Legacies After the White House. And I'd like to introduce Warren Finch. Warren is the director of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, <clears throat> he came to the Bush Library after working with the National Archives and Records Administration, both in Washington, D.C., and then with the Reagan Presidential Library and Museum in California. Trained as an archivist, <clears throat> uh, Warren was assigned to the Bush White House in 1992 to assist with the move of uh, Bush presidential materials to the new uh, library in College Station. He first served as deputy director and became director in 2004. And introduce Alan Lowe, is the director of the George W. Bush Presidential Library. He has uh, previously worked within the National Archives Presidential Library System as interim director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York. <laughs> He also led the building and development of the Baker Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee. That's the other Baker <laughs> Institute, uh, named, of course, for the other Reagan chief of staff, Howard Baker. Uh, he now oversees the Bush Library and Museum in, in, in the Bush Center, inaugurated last month. Uh, Secretary Baker and I were there. It was a magnificent uh, event. Very moving to see five American presidents 
uh, together on the stage and, and just the body language of these five American presidents, the way they interacted with one, one another, you only wish that Washington could replicate the bipartisanship one, one saw uh, on that stage, but it was a, a, a terrific uh, event. So please uh, join me in welcoming our panel. Uh, the format is to have each director speak uh, for about 12 to 15 minutes on, on their respective library, their founding and core activities. Uh, then I'll start with a couple of questions before uh, opening up the discussion with you uh, in the audi audience. Uh, so I will now uh, turn uh, first to uh, the youngest and the oldest, uh, Mark. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for, uh, for hosting this evening. We, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of Secretary Baker, so this is a rare privilege uh, for, for, for me to be here with you tonight. Um, I have a brief presentation here, which I think shows the scope of a presidential library. We are, there are 13 of us now that uh, Alan has opened his shop uh, up on the campus of Southern Methodist University, and we are like, 13 siblings in a family. We all are very distinct. We have our own personalities. And the size and scope and ambitions of our organizations are slightly different. That's the great thing about presidential libraries. And in so many ways, we reflect the personalities of those men whose names are on the, our, our buildings. The LBJ Library was the fifth presidential library in the system under the auspices of the National Archives and sits, as you may know, on the University of Texas at Austin's uh, campus. This is um, uh, a speech that LBJ gave during the dedication of our presidential library on May 22, 1971. And I think it gives you a flavor of the kind of institution that he wanted in his presidential library. So it's all here, the story of our time with the Marco. A president sees things from a unique perspective. No one can share his responsibility. No one can share the scope of his duties or the burdens of his decisions. There is no record of a mistake or an unpleasantness or criticism that is not included in the files here. Emblematic of, of President Johnson's remarks about, uh, you know, the, it, it's all here, the story of our time with the bark off, is the transparency with which he wanted his presidency treated. And one of the exhibits in the LBJ library is when you ascend stairs going from the third floor, which houses part of our exhibit, to the fourth floor in what's called the Great Hall, you see before you the records of the administration in those binders, some of the 55 million documents that we have under our roof, right before your eyes. Again, it's meant to, to symbolize the transparency with which we treat our presidential administrations. We have 70, uh, 700,000 White House photographs, artifacts, uh, and, and head of state gifts, and I think the crown jewel of the uh, LBJ Library archives, as I was telling the ambassador a moment ago, are the 643 hours of taped phone conversations that we have of President Johnson doing the business of his presidency. This, these are a rare opportunity to hear a president doing his job. And I thought I'd give you an example of one of the best in that 600, uh, of those 643 hours. This is a conversation that LBJ had with Martin Luther King on November 25th, 1963, on what was the second full day of LBJ's presidency. This is a remarkable conversation. Oh, it was a remarkable conversation. Bear with me. Let me see if we can do this again. There we go. Uh, interest in your cooperation and your uh, communication, and a good many people told me that they uh, heard about your statement, I guess, on TV, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, I, uh -huh. 
I, I've been locked up in this office and I haven't seen it, but I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that, and I knew that you had just that great spirit, and you know you have our support and backing. Well, because we know what a difficult period this is. It's a, it's a, just an impossible period. We've got a budget coming up that we got nothing to do with. It's practically already made, and we've got a civil rights bill that hadn't even passed the House, and it's November, and Hubert Humphrey told me yesterday everybody wanted to go home. We've got a tax bill that they hadn't touched, and we just... Uh, got to let up, not let up on any of them and keep going, and I guess they'll say that I'm repudiated, but I'm going to ask the Congress Wednesday to just stay there and let pass them all. They won't do it, but we'll just keep them there next year till they do, and we just won't give up an inch. Uh-huh. Well, this is, this is mighty fine. I think it's, uh, it's so imperative. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. I well, never needed more than I do now. Well, you know you have it, and just feel free to call on us for anything. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Call me when you're I sure will. Call me when you're down here next time. I certainly will. But let's get together, and, and any suggestions you got, bring them in. Fine. I certainly will do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so began one of the great partnerships of the 20th century. So it's an incredible conversation. And it represents, uh, for me, some of the great work that has been done in, in presidential libraries. We found out that these, uh, when I say we, I didn't have anything to do with this uh, well before my time. But uh, the existence of these uh, tapes came to light after President Johnson died. Uh, and they were years later processed by our staff at the Presidential Library. And I, again, I think are one of the great records of the U.S. presidency that will ever exist. We uh, have, I mentioned that those, uh, those records are treated with great transparency. You can access those records, those binders that you saw uh, in that picture that I first showed you are on those little carts. So those binders, they, they will be brought to you and you can actually see the files yourself. You can see these original documents from the Johnson administration in our research room. You can do the same in, in Warren's and Allen's shops. Uh, it's an incredible resource for, not only for presidential historians, but uh, for, for uh, PhD, st PhD students and and uh, undergraduate students on the University of Texas campus, principally in our case. We've just, uh, as the ambassador said, renovated our museum. We spent about $11 million doing so. It is a, um, uh, a remarkable exhibit. This is, just gives you a s sense of what it now looks like. If you've not been to the LBJ Library, I would urge you to come. We have seen our traffic as a result of this mm -hmm. exhibit spike by about 70 percent. And uh, there was, com there was a compelling, many compelling reasons to renovate the exhibit, not the least of which is that there is technology today that didn't exist two years ago, let alone 20 years ago when we last renovated the exhibit. And additionally, it didn't contain those telephone recordings that I talked about. Uh, those recordings have been processed since the, uh, uh, the museum was last renovated. So they stand front and center in the exhibit and really bring to life this bigger than life and wholly consequential president. Finally, we have an, we, we have an education arm, um, student activities for elementary, middle school, and high school students. We have teacher workshops. Uh, and uh, I, along with my, uh, uh, one of my predecessors, Harry Middleton, who is the director of the LBJ Presidential Library for 31 years, teach a course for University of Texas students. And here's Lucy Johnson, the youngest daughter of Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson, as a guest lecturer. Oops, that screwed up again. <laughs> Not going to invite me back. Oh. I think that uh, uh, serving uh, in politics it's the most jealous mistress there is. It wants you more than 24 hours a day. It wants all you have and some. 
The great thing about this class, and I'm not sure, I'm not aware of the existence of anything comparable, is that we get people who knew Lyndon Johnson to talk to these kids. And we, we teach this course like uh, Tom Sawyer painted his fence. We get other people to do it, uh, including Lucy Johnson and including the uh, a few people who were actually in the administration. So uh, our, our undergraduate students really get a, a keen understanding from, uh, of the history of the Johnson administration from those who lived it. Um, finally, we have public and academic programming, and I think some of the best in the United States. 15 plus programs a year. We have a thousand seat auditorium that we fill about half the time, and a, a little over a thousand friends of the LBJ Library who are subscribers to our ongoing programming. I mentioned that uh, bark off philosophy that, that LBJ had. And I think it's uh, and important to note that while uh, we are presidential libraries and developed around the presidents uh, that we represent, we also, I think, in the case of the LBJ library and in the case of, I think, my, uh, my counterparts, we aim to uh, work towards bipartisanship. And in, in our case, we've not steered away from the most controversial aspects of LBJ's administration. Here's a perfect example of that. This is a symposium that we did on Vietnam back in 1995, taking LBJ at his word that we were going to offer things with the bark off. So this was a very frank discussion on Vietnam featuring Robert McNamara and somebody who had served in Vietnam. And you'll see that this is uh, uh, a, a good indication of how we do steer away for, uh, steer um, uh, aim toward a frank and candid programming. There's several reasons why I've chosen to speak out on Vietnam now. The most compelling one, I state in the preface, and I'll read it for you. We of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations who participated in the decisions on Vietnam acted according to what we thought were the principles and the traditions of this nation. We made our decisions in the light of those values. Yet we were wrong. I believe, we're, <clears throat> I believe we were terribly wrong. And I believe, therefore, we owe it to future generations to explain why. Uh, in July of 1965, my rifle company went to Vietnam with six officers and 200 Marines. Eight months later, on March 4th, 1966, my company was reduced to one officer and 50 Marines. And on that day alone, in Operation Utah, 20 of my Marines died and 40 of us were wounded. If I could but one more time have my first sergeant fall in, Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, to explain to them your book, I would say to them, your Secretary of Defense has written a book that has taken away every geopolitical rationale for the war and any contribution you may have made to win the Cold War. And with a, with that very heavy heart, I would tell my Marines, based on your book, that they have fought and died in vain. That's history with the bark off. Uh, it's a chilling exchange. And uh, uh, we just recently did a program on the, the 11 greatest moments uh, in history of the LBJ library for an audience of about 750. And that was one of the moments that we shared. It is, it is truly chilling. We not only look back uh, in our, in our public program. We will also, importantly, look forward. Uh, LBJ wanted his library to look at the past, but he wanted it to be a springboard for the future. And we aim toward getting the biggest names and best minds of our time to our library. Here's a recent program that we did with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Oh, sorry, I did it again, folks. Mr. President, how will history regard you? Как вы думаете, какое место вы займете в истории? Как вас оценит история? Хороший. Good. Good. The answer is good. Но это шутка. That's um, a joke. Вторая шутка. Вторая шутка. История дама капризная. My second joke is that history is a fickle lady. Но я but I'm proud of the life that I've lived. And let history decide. Uh, Mr. Lucci. 
I, I played that clip for two reasons. Number one, to show you that the, the kind of speaker that we have the, at the LBJ Library, but also because it's appropriate here at the Baker Institute to feature something with Mikhail Gorbachev. But moreover, I would say that that sentiment, let history decide, is very much something that we live by at these presidential libraries. We uh, offer the records to the public at large, and we don't direct history. We let the people decide. And with that, I will turn things over to my colleague, Warren Finch. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you for having us here, Baker Institute, uh, the Texas Tribune. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the collections at the Bush Library. I'm going to tell a story. Because uh, I'm from Alabama, and that's what we do. We tell stories. <laughs> I got to the Bush Library. I was actually the very first employee at the Bush Library. Uh, I was an archivist way back in 1993. And shortly after the records arrived, uh, all the photographs and all the materials, and uh, the director. And uh, he was also from Alabama, two good old boys from Alabama. We sat down with a local newspaper reporter who did an article in the library. We were the big news of the day. And she asked us, she said, so what is in this presidential library? And we said, well, there's about 43 million pages of Bush's presidential materials and his vice presidential materials and Quayle's vice presidential materials. We were the only presidential library to have two vice presidential collections. Uh, we have about a million photographs in the collection, all of Bush's vice presidential and presidential and Quayle vice presidential, plus about 10,000 video cassettes of almost a daily life uh, of President Bush as president. But we also have materials going all the way back to 1924. In fact, we have a film of George Bush taking his first steps at Kennebunk Port, Maine when he was two years old. And then we also have this remarkable film of George Bush when he was shot down. There was a sailor in the conning tower of the submarine with his home movie camera, and he was filming the sailors that we were rescuing. And up onto the submarine, you see George Bush, he's pulled up onto the deck, and he walks across the submarine, and he looks up at the conning tower. So we've got this great film of George Bush being rescued. I mean, talk about serendipity. George Bush had, uh, had left the ser when his service ended. He went off to Yale, and we, he was captain of the baseball team, and Babe Ruth donated his memoirs to Yale, and there on the mound with Babe Ruth accepting his memoirs for Yale University is guess who? George Bush. So, uh, and in addition to all these materials, Mrs. Bush, who kept giving, who kept making, or began making scrapbooks when she and her husband first got married, donated to us over 100 of her scrapbooks. And one of the reasons we redid the museum five years ago is because we wanted to capture the materials that were on those scrapbooks. And also, we also told the reporter we have over 100,000 artifacts, both from the American public and from foreign sources, uh, foreign gifts, and also items that President and Mrs. Bush have donated to the library. So a huge collection of uh, audiovisual materials, textual materials. And she said, what do you hope to do with these materials? And she, we said, we hope to make these, open these materials and make them available to the public because we are a presidential library in the National Archives system. And we are one of the few places in the world where documents are opened up and the public gets to come in and take a look at them. And then she asked a question. She said, is this all the material you're ever going to get? And, we, and the director at the time says, no, in fact, Recently, at the White House, squirreled away in a drawer were some Truman papers found, and they were sent to the Truman Library. We're always going to get more materials, and over the years, we always have. So being two good old boys from Alabama, we went and got the newspaper the next day and read the story. And at the end of the story, the director's in his office. I'm in my office at the time. And we hit the same spot in the newspaper at the same time. He yells, did I actually say that? And I said, no, sir, you didn't. And it says... Director says, this is not all the materials it'll ever get. In fact, recently, Truman's stuffed pet squirrel was found in a, a drawer at the White House and sent to his library. <laughs> <coughs> so it taught me a couple things. Be careful what you say, and what you sometimes say is not always what you say. 
Um, we see uh, in, in schools today, I think uh, math and science have become probably a hallmark of, the, of what education uh, may be lacking. But we, we see that as math and science become more and more of a focus, something called civic literacy is being lost. Kids no longer know how their system works, how the presidency works, how the republic works. And so we, we try in our museum through our education department where we have thousands and thousands and thousands of school children come through every year. It's a free service that both our presidential library, the Johnson Library, and the George W. Library provides. Um, that all kids can come in and come to the museum and participate in our education programs for free. We also do something new. Um, technology is great. And so we send out now our education programs through the web. And we did a program is with Mrs. Bush this, uh, this past uh, February in which she spoke to 70,000 school children across the US, Canada, Germany, and Africa. And through this interactive network, the children in those schools were able to ask Mrs. Bush a question. So there was a school group in Tennessee. There was a school group in Alberta, Canada. There was a school group in Germany. And then f the final question came from a school group in Ghana, Africa. Just an amazing program. And it's amazing what you can do through technology. And of course, Mrs. Bush's message was, both civic literacy and also literacy. And so as Mark does at his presidential library, we do some great programs. They're all free and they're all open to the, uh, to the public. We do great speakers, as does Mark and Alan will also. We'll give him a little bit of time, he just opened. We try to be nonpartisan and nonpolitical and we try to have, uh, we try to have open and frank discussions. Uh, we sometimes get in trouble for some of the speakers we have, but we try to have speakers from both the left and the right and the middle and uh, everywhere in between. And when you come to do research at the Bush Library, we don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or a communist. If you're an anarchist, we probably do care. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we don't. So um, we've, we, we are, we're Texas treasures, but we're, there, we're 13 presidential libraries located across the country. And I think we're, we're treasures across the United States. There's some people that say, why aren't all the presidential libraries combined and put in Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. Well, sc school kids around Washington, D.C., they're exposed, they can be exposed to uh, 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 George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. I think there's a benefit to putting, the president, to putting these presidential libraries across the country in the places that the presidents feel comfortable and spreading that notion, that mission, that knowledge of what the presidency is, how great this country is, and, uh, and, and what civic literacy is. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Lowe, director of the George W. Bush Library. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for having us here. I'm so impressed with the Baker Institute. Mark and Warren, your hard act to follow. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my background and how I found presidential libraries. Is this going to work for me? Technology doesn't like me. There you go. Um, I I'm a native of Kentucky. I don't know if any Kentuckians in the room, but uh, yes, very good. We're going to be good friends. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Kentucky. I interviewed uh, while I was there for a job at the Reagan Library. They called me up one day. I put a resume out to a few federal agencies. I just finished my master's degree. And the supervisor there interviewed me for half an hour to be an archivist on the phone. And at the end of it, he said, why do you want to work here? Final question. I said, as a student of history, it's been my lifelong dream to work at a presidential library. And he literally said, you're hired. This was Rod Sobers, Warren, our old, our old boss. And he gave me a report date in September. I said, fantastic. I hung up the phone and thought, what the hell is a presidential library? I had no idea <laughs> what I just committed to doing. I had zero idea. 
But I moved to the Reagan Library in Los Angeles, and there I learned to love the mission of the Presidential Library. It really became the passion of my professional life. So in this slide, you see the beautiful Reagan Library there in the upper part of the slide on the left-hand side. Uh, I later moved to the central office of Presidential Library. So we are part of the National Archives and Records Administration. That central office helps oversee the now 13 presidential libraries around the country and advocate uh, for those libraries. So the, the, the building there you see on the left-hand uh, part of the slide on the bottom is the, the archives building downtown where, where Warren and I worked for uh, part of that time. Then on the right-hand side on the bottom part is the Archives 2 facility out in College Park, Maryland, uh, where the Office of Presidential Libraries now is located. As you heard from the ambassador, I also for a short time, for about six years, was the founding executive director of the Howard Baker Center in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. And being at the Baker Institute, I had to put a photo of that on this slide as well, <laughs> there in the upper right-hand side. <laughs> Now, uh, you heard also I was acting director of the FDR Library for a short time in the late 90s. And I tell you that because uh, we owe a debt to FDR. He created the first presidential library. He realized a lot of materials were being created and received that should be saved for future generations. So he created this presidential library you see here in the upper part of the slide uh, near his home in Hyde Park, New York, and gave that building over to the National Archives to run as the first presidential library. That's still the model we use today. All the facilities are built with private funds and then given over to the National Archives to run as a presidential library. So we have a great debt, I think, to FDR. In the bottom part of the slide, you see his home, which is on the same property. That's run by the National Park Service. So up in Hyde Park, that's kind of a joint operation with the archives running the library and museum and the Park Service running the home. Now, I want to show you a little bit. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. First of all, I want to say it's great to be in Texas with two other presidential libraries. Uh, I, tell, I moved to Texas in April of 2009 to start this job. I say I've learned many Texas lessons since I got here. The first one I learned was on day one. I was living at a residence inn in Louisville, Texas, just north of Dallas. And my wife was, and kid were still in Knoxville selling the house and finishing school. So it was like I was back in college, and I had to go to the Walmart that first night and stock up my kitchenette. And I was standing in line behind a guy, and I struck up a conversation. And I said, well, you know, I'm kind of sad. I miss my family and my friends, but I'm glad I still live in the South. I said, I grew up in Kentucky. I've lived in Virginia and Tennessee. I like the South. I'm glad I still live in the South. And he looked at me and he said, son, you don't live in the South. You live in Texas, right? <laughs> so you all understand this. This is a many, many lessons since then, but it's great to be in Texas uh, with these other, our other presidential libraries here. Now, you heard uh, Mark and Warren talk about their wonderful archives. We have an amazing archives at the George W. Bush Library as well. And of course, that archives forms the foundation of everything we do. Uh, we have about, seven, let's look first at paper. We have around 70 million pages of paper records at the George W. Bush Library. Uh, materials created and received by the Executive Office of the President. Also, in partnership with the state, he, we have his gubernatorial records as well. So if you want to learn about George W. Bush, you come to the George W. Bush Library. I want to show you uh, some example of the 70 million pages. Uh, they all start being accessible through the Freedom of Information Act next January, by the way, January of 2014. But we've opened about 200,000 pages early. When we opened our facility this past May 1st, uh, we also opened about 200,000 pages just to give people a taste of what we have in the archives. This is one of my favorite items. Uh, we opened actually a couple years ago for an exhibit we did at the Meadows Museum at SMU. This is page one of three pages of notes that President Bush made on September 11th. He was still at the elementary school in Florida where he had learned of the horrific attacks of that day. And these were notes he made in preparation for his first statement to the press. I know they're kind of hard to read. He, he wrote, uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Uh, for me, it's a fascinating and important historical document. Our president, for the first time, putting on paper his reaction to that day and how he's going to talk to the American people and the people of the world about the attacks of September 11th. So that's just one uh, page of our over 70 million pages of paper records. The thing, though, that really distinguishes us at the George W. Bush Library is the size of our electronic archives. Really, for the first time with our library, you see the impact of the computer on uh, the White House operations. We have around 80 terabytes of electronic information. Now, that's a lot. I, I, uh, I grew up on a tobacco farm in Kentucky, and I have a history degree. So 80 terabytes to me sounded big when I got the job, but I wasn't quite sure what it meant. <laughs> it became real to me in two ways. When I compared it to our friends at the Clinton Library, the most recent presidential library before us, we have 80 terabytes, they have four terabytes. 
So you see just in a relatively short amount of time how the use of email and Word documents and all these other things have vastly changed uh, what goes into the archives. Secondly, it became real to me when I looked at the email component. We have over 200 million emails that have been preserved from the Bush administration. Those average about five pages apiece. So just in our email collection alone, we have over a billion pages of electronic information. So truly a vast volume of information. So we don't have great uh, recordings like you do, Mark, but I think these emails really give a great look inside how the Bush White House operated. I think they're a treasure trove for students and scholars uh, going down the road. Our real challenge, they're preserved. Our real challenge uh, for my staff of archivists, I have a staff of 41 now, 16 archivists among them, is how do you process that much stuff? And we're working on that now. We're all about, at the National Archives, providing access to information. So we have to really uh, face this challenge of this vast volume of amazingly useful electronic information. We also have a really spectacular audiovisual archives. Uh, photographs, videotapes, captures of news feeds, and so forth. We have, for example, about four million photographs. Uh, this uh, administration went digital for the last four years, so they have more photos than any, any other presidential administration because of that. And we have around 43,000 artifacts, primarily foreign and domestic gifts to the president and first lady, and a few other items they picked up along the way. When you come up to see our museum, which we open on May 1st, by the way, we dedicate it on April 25th. We open to the public on May 1st. From May 1st until yesterday, we had over 20,000 people visit the museum. So it's been very popular, very, very well received. Uh, you'll see this bullhorn when you go through the exhibit. It's the bullhorn he used at the World Trade Center site when he first visited there after the attacks. As you recall, someone handed him that bullhorn. Someone yelled out, we can't hear you. He said, I can hear you. The whole world hears you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Uh, I'm very, very happy someone thought to keep the bullhorn, and we have it now in the museum exhibit. A few other items from our collection. If you like baseball, uh, the baseball bat in the upper part of this slide was signed by 46 members of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So it is somewhat of a holy grail if you like baseball. <laughs> Uh, in the lower right-hand side, you see a purse given to Mrs. Bush by the Queen of Thailand. Believe it or not, it's made from tiny fern vines. And of course, it's adorned with gold and diamonds. In the lower left, you see the weapon captured with Saddam Hussein in Iraq and later given to the president by members of the Special Forces. That also is in our museum exhibit. Here you see a very important item. This is President Bush holding the Howard badge. Uh, Mrs. Arlene Howard gave this to President Bush when he visited uh, New York after the attacks. Uh, it's the badge of her son, George Howard. He had rushed to the World Trade Center on September 11th. He was a Port Authority officer. He had rushed to the World Trade Center that day, even though he was off duty, and he died saving others. Uh, every day thereafter, President Bush carried this badge with him until just very, very recently when he gave it over to us to be included in the permanent museum exhibit. So that exhibit, uh, very interactive, very, I think, very innovatively put forth. Uh, again, very popular with folks. We, we open by giving some background about President and Mrs. Bush. We talk about the 2000 election, by the way. We have a voting machine from Palm Beach County. We have a vial of hanging chads and butterfly ballots. It's all there, right? We see, we see uh, Jim, Secretary Baker there, right? right? We do, right? right? Um, and then we, we began the museum uh, talking about the domestic agenda. Recall there was going to be a No Child Left Behind, education reform, faith-based initiatives, this real domestic focus. And then you turn a corner. And you see this, a 22-foot piece of steel from the World Trade Center. And we wanted to, to express in the exhibit how everything changed in that day for, obviously, for the administration, obviously, for our nation and the world. Around this, we have the names of the victims of the day, videos. And then immediately after this part, uh, we have the 10 days after September 11th, leading up uh, to the president's address to a joint uh, session of Congress. We also have a full-scale replica of the Oval Office that you can go in and sit in the furniture, sit behind the desk. But another unique part of our exhibit is we also have what we call the Texas Rose Garden. So about midway through your museum experience, we thought you've, you've seen information on September 11th. We talk a lot about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, some pretty uh, difficult, heavy topics. Uh, we wanted people to be able to take a break about midway through. So after you go in the Oval Office, you can go out into the Rose Garden, just like at the real White House. 
I joke with them all the time. They call it the Texas Rose Garden because they put plants in here that can survive a thousand degree heat, which we get here. I've, I've learned after four years, that's what happens every summer. But it's really a beautiful place. And uh, we see a lot of visitors going out there and taking a break and then going back in and finishing up the exhibit. This one other thing I'll tell you about the exhibit, a really popular feature is something called the Decision Points Theater, uh, where you can go in for about six or seven minutes, act like the president. You choose a scenario with your compatriots in the room. For example, uh, would you support the surge in Iraq? And you get conflicting advice. That's one of the good things. Again, we want to show uh, both sides of this equation. You go to different sources of information, and they give you completely different advice. Two advisors, do it, don't do it. And here's the reasons you should or shouldn't do it. Uh, we want to show that presidents get that type of conflicting information, and that at the end of the day, they have to make decisions based on their principles and their history. Uh, and it's been a really, really popular, I think, very educational part of the exhibit. As you heard from my compatriots, uh, we do a lot in public and educational programming. We're just starting up a conference series and a speaker series. But we've been out in schools for the last two years. Even before our building was cre uh, completed, we wanted to make sure we were being a resource to local and regional schools. So I've had a very dynamic education specialist out doing teacher workshops, creating online materials, creating in-class uh, resources for teachers. Uh, we work, obviously, a lot with our colleagues at Southern Methodist University. We're very proud to be part of the SMU family. And we're working with them on quite a number of initiatives. Uh, for example, one of our classrooms is the White House Situation Rooms Conference Room. Uh, during the Bush administration, the entire Situation Room complex was renovated, and they literally ripped two rooms out and sent them to us at the Bush Library. So we reconstructed the actual conference room from the Situation Room, and now kids can come in, sit in the real furniture, be surrounded by the real paneling, and take part in simulations. The second room, by the way, I had no room for. Uh, so we sent it to our colleagues at the Reagan Library in California, my old home out there. They reconstructed it there, and the hope is down the road, when we do simulations with students, that students in California then can take part in those simulations with students in Texas. And SMU, by the way, has been a great partner in thinking about how do you program that space, what kind of technology do you need, and so forth. There's our website, of course. We encourage you to go on there, and we encourage you, please, come up and visit us in Dallas. And with that, I want to thank you again for having us here. Thank you so much. You all mic? We are. Yes, sir. Great. Well, thank you very much for those excellent presentations. You could see the distinct difference in persona and history in each uh, presidential library. These are truly national treasures. And again, we're very proud that we have three presidential libraries in, in Texas. Uh, let me start the discussion broadly with a quote from a well-known biographer, Robert Caro. He says, quote, we're, we're, we're taught Lord Acton's axiom, all power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But I don't believe it's always true anymore. What I believe is always true about power is that power always reveals. The modern U.S. presidency is clearly a, an immensely powerful position. How do each of you see the role of the presidential libraries that you run in understanding what has been uh, truly revealed in each one of these men? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. have to start Go ahead. chronologically. Please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Yeah, before I became a director of a presidential libraries, the ambassador said I was, a, uh, I was an author of a couple of books since written another one. But uh, my first was, book was about presidents after they leave uh, the White House, their, their post-presidential years. And I interviewed four uh, ex-presidents for the project. But I spent most of my time doing research at the presidential libraries. And so I know firsthand how remarkable these institutions are. I had occasion to work with my own library. And I just saw it from the other side. And I was, uh, I was astounded at how much the archivists knew and how much material they pointed me toward that, were really, that was really helpful to the project. So the ambassador just mentioned Robert Caro, one of the 400 plus researchers that we get in our research room every year uh, is Robert Caro. Invariably, he shows up to, to research one of his uh, uh, tomes on, on Lyndon Johnson, who is I think the, uh, the, the best example of a creature of power that I can possibly think of. But the, the amazing thing about uh, 
about LBJ is uh, he had a sizable ego. I mean, he was a larger than life personality and he had a, an ego that, that was consistent with that you know, outsized persona. But uh, at the same time, he really didn't micromanage history. He talked about how he wanted to be remembered, but he really wanted that institution to speak for his administration. He wanted you to go in to research his record and come to your own conclusion about whether he was a good or bad president. Uh, and that's, that I really do appreciate that about presidential libraries in general. We're all different. We all have a, a, a slightly different approach. But I'm proud uh, of the fact that we offer the record to the, to the American public, to, to the public at large, to draw their own conclusions. Warren? Well, I think our record shows probably what most people already know about President Bush is that um, he was a coalition builder. Um, never, never come across a man quite like them that, that throughout his career, everybody he ever met, he remembered. A short story, uh, because I think it says something about uh, President Bush. We, we had just opened, there's uh, about 20 of us at the Presidential Library, and President Bush came by. And there was one person that stayed in her office because uh, she didn't want to be a bother and she didn't want to come out of her office. So uh, President Bush went around and met everyone. And on his way out, he notices the one person that he hadn't met. There were probably, uh, including our staff of 20, but all the other people there, there may have been 50 or 60 people, but he was able to pick out of the crowd the one person that he hadn't met. And that, I thought, was amazing. But, you see throughout his career and his records, while he's at the CIA, uh, uh, while he's at the UN, uh, while he's in China, and, and, and we have a diary he kept when he was in China, and I, <clears throat> his predecessor, his advice from his predecessor is, um, you shouldn't go out and meet the Chinese or, or the other consulates. Uh, you should stay and make them come to you. And he writes in that diary, that's exactly what he's not gonna do. <laughs> that, uh, and he did. He went to every national celebration. He and Mrs. Bush went to visit all the sites in, in uh, uh, China. He took Chinese lessons. He got to the point where he could converse with his barber. He could, and I think probably the, the, the reason he wanted to, the, to the Chinese lessons was so he could invite people to lunch and to play tennis, which is mm. how good he got at his Chinese. But at the UN he met people, and he remembered these people. And so <coughs> people who were junior, and junior statesmen at the UN, or, uh, or the people he met, and, and other places, when he became president of the United States, those people rose up with him. One more story, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and then, Stories are good. But we had, a, we had an exhibit on China, and there was a picture of George Bush when he was US liaison to China, and he's in Tibet or he's in Mongolia, and he's drinking uh, uh, what we thought was tea. The uh, Chinese ambassador comes in and he says, you see that picture? And I said, yes, sir, that's, uh, that's the picture of uh, George Bush in, uh, in Mongolia, and he's drinking tea. He says, first of all, he's not drinking tea, he's drinking yak's butter. And it takes a very courageous man to drink yak's butter. But he says, do you see, <coughs> do you see the interpreter in the picture? And I said, yes. He says, that's me. So th the person who had acted as interpreter, who Bush had kept in touch with for all these years, became the US ambassador from China. And not to go on for too long, but I think that's, our records tell that story of how President Bush operated so that when the Gulf War happened, he could call up the phone and call Helmut Kohl because he knew Helmut Kohl. <coughs> He could call up, he could pick the phone up and call President Mitterrand because he knew them. Or he could call the junior people or the ambassadors in, in all these countries because he knew them. He knew the leaders of the Middle East because that's, that's, he may not be great in, a, a President Bush may not have been perfect in large, in front of large audiences, but in small groups, he got to know people. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it, it, it's a Terrific commentary because I served in, under under President Bush for many years, and what I found remarkable is that he would deliberately call people when he had nothing to ask them for. 
Hmm. Just mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. just to so keep that when he did have a reason to ask for something, it wasn't a cold call. He had developed a relationship with leaders all over the world, which is a tremendous uh, guidance for whoever you are in life yeah. to cultivate your relationships. You never know when you're going to need something from someone, and it's a, mar a remarkable trait. Alan? Uh, it's hard to beat Warren's stories, but I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think it, to, to really understand, that's, that's good. Kentucky, 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 Kentucky we've got to work on that a little bit more. Uh, of course, our museum, I think, if you really want to understand George W. Bush, the decisions he made, what we tried to do in creating this exhibit is talk about some of the underlying principles that led him to make those decisions. So that's something from the very beginning President Bush wanted us to stress. So I think in the day, when you go through the exhibit, you learn more about the the developments of the Bush administration and so forth, but also something more fundamental, I think, about why he did what he did. Um, you know, it's, it's been fascinating to me, again, as uh, someone who loves history and uh, studies the presidency, to sit in meetings with George W. Bush and with Laura Bush and to hear them say, this is what I was thinking when this was happening. Mm. This is what was important to me. These were my priorities at that time, and trying to incorporate that into the exhibit planning. Of course, on the archive side, always call the archives the raw material of history. If you really want to understand how something developed, go and look at the primary sources. Mm -hmm. That's something we always talk to our students about and everyone about. That's really, really where you really understand the person and the administration. I'll tell you, one of the things this job has given me over the years is an appreciation that, you know, Senator Howard Baker is a great man, and one of the things he taught me a lot about <coughs> is about civility and how often in the political ranker of the day you can lose sight of the fact that these are people. Uh, no matter if you agree or disagree with them politically, they're people trying their best to do uh, to do a job of service and, and to sit down, I, I have a, a beautiful and very intelligent daughter and to go into a, me a meeting with President Bush where he, she first met him and she was so nervous, rubbing her legs like this and President Bush came in and said, are you nervous Carolyn because I'm nervous? And she said, yes sir, and he goes, well let's not be nervous together. <laughs> you know, and so that's a very human <coughs> thing to see. You see, these are human beings trying their best to agree or disagree with them, that's what they're doing and I respect all of them for being in the arena and doing that. I think, Alan, one of the most telling things you had in your slide uh, about uh, President George W. Bush was that he carried that badge yes. mm. with him all the time, which shows you how immensely 9-11 affected his whole presidency. That's right. Um, Probably his decision making. And, uh, and I notice in his book, Decision Points, because you know many of these decisions he made are controversial, be it mm -hmm. Especially on Iraq, where he at least honestly says in his book, the jury is out, history will tell. And what you just said, the archives are going to be a lodestone, a precious lodestone for historians to go in and analyze how those decisions were made. Over a billion pages of material. Over a billion people to come in, do the research, right. make up your own mind uh, based on that real evidence, not based on political opinions or anything like that. So, that, absolutely very important, I think. Warren, can I tell a story about Please. your president? Please. When I was ambassador to uh, Damascus, we started getting our hostages out of Beirut, and President Bush was very, very personally interested in each one. And so I would sent a telegram back that I was being summoned to the foreign ministry. I think another American hostage was going to come out. President Bush was in a boat off Islamagorda, is it Florida, where he, uh, he, he was on a boat off the coast of Florida. And I was getting ready and had my talking points, preparing my talking points. I had my staff around me in the residence. I was going to go to the foreign ministry to receive, and I really didn't know who it was going to be. I had an idea, but we didn't know. And I had all these notes on my, my knees, and the phone rings. And I go, is this uh, Ambassador George? And yes, hold the line. White House operator, hold the line. <coughs> a third voice came on. A fourth voice came on. And then finally, a fifth and very young voice came on and said, the next voice you will hear will be that of the President of the United States of America. Well, I've been around for a while, but I was so damn impressed, I stood up. <laughs> <laughs> and all my notes fell onto the ground <laughs> at the moment I needed those notes. And then the president comes on the line. He says, Ed, do you know who it's going to be? Blah, blah, blah. And he keeps asking me these questions, and I'm scrambling for my notes. <laughs> I'm scrambling for my notes. And he said, what do you plan to say? Well, I said, well, Mr. President, I plan to say, he says, well, I'll be watching you on CNN. And then he said something, <laughs> he said something very uh, personal. He said, uh, if uh, the gentleman is well enough, I want to talk to him as soon as you get him back, mm -hmm. and which he did, which he talked to him. 
One question I have for all three of you is, can or should a presidential library be objective uh, in its assessment? Uh, I have a view on that. Before I answer the question, let me, because my colleagues have told stories. I'm going to tell you a story about LBJ. <laughs> Everybody who knows LBJ has a story. And I just heard one recently that I hadn't heard before, and it's now one of my favorites. But LBJ was uh, Senate majority leader, and he was campaigning. He was about to plan a trip back to Texas to campaign. And he brought his speechwriters into his office, and he started reviewing the stump speech that they had prepared for him, and he stumbled across a quote from Socrates in the speech. And he said, Socrates? He says, Socrates? He says, I'm going back to Texas to talk to just plain folks, and you have me quoting Socrates? He said, keep the quote, but start it with, my daddy always used to say. <laughs> That's a great story. And the amazing thing about LBJ is you know it's true. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I am of the view, I, uh, when uh, uh, Alan's shop just opened, uh, I, I, I was asked to do some interviews, and, and people were asking me whether you know, we could expect, we should expect an objective view of the Bush administration from the George W. Bush Library. I don't think that that's possible. I don't think while a president's alive, while they have some direction over their presidential libraries, that an objective view is possible. They are, to some degree, directing the content of that exhibit. That said, these are very valuable in understanding, as Alan said in the case of his shop, uh, what the president was thinking when he was making the decisions in his administration. Uh, Decision Points, President Bush's memoir, sold, I think, three million copies, and it was all about his decisions and what his, why his thinking led him to those decisions based on those core beliefs that he held. So I think that objectivity is hard to expect uh, in the initial stages. And I don't think that we have an objective view of our presidents for at least a generation uh, after they leave office. You're seeing George H.W. Bush's reputation really burnished in history. Uh, but we, we bounced him out of office in 1992 in favor of Bill Clinton. I think he's going to be considered one of our near great presidents, particularly in light of the foreign policy that, uh, that he crafted with Secretary James Baker. In LBJ's case, we can now, I think, look a little bit more objectively at his administration. The remarkable thing about LBJ is that he was the Vietnam president upon leaving office. Uh, that conflict divided this nation and defined, I think, in, in large measure his administration when he left office. Now, 40 years later, as passions have cooled and that the long, dark shadow of Vietnam has receded, we, I think, recognize him rightfully so as the civil rights president for delivering the elusive promise of all men are created equal. So things change. And I think we, we tend to get it right as we get more perspective on an administration. But it's impossible to be objective in the early years. Thank you. Mark? And I, I would say that uh, we're 20 years going 20 years now from the, from the administration. I think as time goes on, you get a bigger, broader picture of the, the whole administration. Uh, right, after you, right after the president left office, the, the, the campaign uh, was probably the focus and uh, why, why President Bush lost the campaign. But as time goes on, there's much more perspective We've gone through our first uh, renovation, uh, first exhibit lasted 10 years, and we're now into our se second exhibit. And, and there's much deeper uh, perspective in, in the se second exhibit. But frankly, the exhibit's great, but there's 43 million pages of presidential records there. And there's all the videotape, and it's for the historians to come to uh, write the uh, history of, uh, of Bush 41. And we're beginning to see those books written. And my opinion is that George H.W. Bush will fare very, very well. But uh, our job is to provide the materials for those serious histories uh, to be written. The museum is there to educate 
and about the administration, about how our system of government operates and the key events of the Bush administration. But uh, change, exhibits in the future will change based on what, uh, how historians assess this president and the, the key uh, events of his administration. And speaking, oh. speaking of books, uh, one thing just to plug, uh, Jeff Ingalls uh, edited version of George H.W.'s H.W. Bush's China Diary is fantastic. If you, haven't, from us. if you haven't read that, it's, it's really a great read and really uh, shows a lot about the, the great man I think that George H.W. Bush is. So, so getting to the question, I agree with, agree with my colleagues, but you know, there is, uh, for us, we just finished this four-year process of designing and installing a museum exhibit, and the National Archives is part of that process from the very beginning, so we are part of that team. So I can say at the end of the day, it's a very professionally done exhibit that you know, I can stand behind and say I'm proud to be director of it. Uh, there is uh, obviously a huge role that the President and Mrs. Bush play in talking about ideas, uh, even the themes, the concept of looking at principles and so forth, they were very much a part of that. Uh, I think it does change over time. But I can tell you, even in this exhibit at our very, our very first two weeks of operations, that we tried to, throughout the exhibit, uh, not always editorialize, that we tried to provide information that's what the archives is all about. So uh, we don't necessarily duck difficult issues. Uh, we talk about Katrina. Uh, you know, in our Decision Points Theater, you hear completely opposite views on how Katrina should be handled. The same types of things President Bush was, was hearing. Uh, so yes, there is um, a lot of, uh, I think, a very important historical value of being able to see what the President thought about these various issues, these various developments and things do change over time, but at the same time, I think we can stand and say we're proud of the exhibit we have now uh, and that it's a very professionally done, very educational, uh, informative exhibit. And then, as, as Warren said, uh, the real thing is to say, come look at these over a billion pages of documents. And there, you know, everyone on the planet, uh, starting next January the 20th, can submit a Freedom of Information Act request. We are getting ready for that deluge of requests. We know that will happen. Uh, so then, again, come in, look at this, this uh, this uh, history in the boxes and make up your own mind. I mean, it's, it's, a great, it's one of the great things about America is that the documents are, are provided and you get to make the decision. The decision's not made for you. I think uh, that's one of the real values. You know, w I, w I showed you the clip of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and w when we had a dinner for him afterwards, uh, w Warren was kind enough to supply a letter from George H.W. Bush for the occasion. And, uh, Warren read it and we gave it to President Gorbachev after the dinner. And he clutched it to, I don't know if you knew this, but he clutched it to his heart. And he said, you know, my, I don't have any of these things. I don't have documents from my administration. They're scattered to the wind. Hmm. We don't have presidential libraries in, you know, we didn't have them in the Soviet Union. We don't have them in Russia. Uh, these are remarkable facilities. And it was, it was a very touching moment, actually. Uh, and you realized how, how you realized how valuable it is as Americans to have these repositories uh, to document our administrations. Mark Allen mentioned how uh, presidential libraries can change over time. Have you seen an evolution of the LBJ library from the beginning to what it is now? Has there been a change, or does it not really change? Well, I think it has to change. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, we, the, the man whose name graces our building died 40 years ago in 1973. And uh, uh, we've, we've had to become a, continue to be a vital uh, institution. Fortunately, President Johnson made that easy for us by uh, giving us this dictate that we had to look at, use this, the library as a vehicle uh, and as a forum to hold forth on the issues of our times. So we're not just about the Johnson administration. We hold those records, mm. uh, but we're also about, um, as you saw, the, the, the public program. We had Newt Gingrich recently, a uh, very different point in the political perspective than LBJ would have been, but we have him into our halls to talk about what issues uh, matter to us today. And for you, these tapes, the release of the tapes have done a lot to change the image uh, of yeah. LBJ. Yeah, they've indicated him to a large me in, in large measure. You're, you you're too young to answer that question. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you well, just yes. opened your doors. Well, we've changed a lot from being in a warehouse to the new building. That's <laughs> about building. all we've changed right. so far, right, right. Well, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Please. Could you elaborate on how 
I or any other citizen would have access to these papers and get into those research cubicles and how, how do we go about doing that? Well, uh, go, go ahead. So you, the research room is open. We charge, you, if you want to go through the museum, it's seven bucks. If you want to do research in the museum and the, in the archives, you come, you come to the research room. You can go online and see what's available for research. Where, as I said, we've been work, we've been at this for quite a while, so we have a lot of materials. A, a, a lot of the classified stuff has been declassified and has been made available. You come to the library, you write down which boxes you want to see. In our case, a archivist goes across the hall to the stacks, pulls the box for, for you, and in about three minutes, you're in the records. And. Uh, so you say, well, there's 43 million pages there. There's, you got 10,000 boxes. You know, it's like diving into the sea and try, or like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Well, that's what the archivists are there for. You tell them what you're interested in, and they are, they are able to narrow the scope for you and say, this is where you want to look. This is what you want to look for. The Gulf War, they can bring boxes out. You can go through the entire Gulf War health policy, AIDS policy. The records are there. And um, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you come and you study the entire Bush administration in one afternoon, but you can, you can get a slice of what's going on, and um, and and the archivists are very knowledgeable. They're the ones that processed all the records, and uh, they can help you. But Lady that's Jane. unique in this country. Lady? To piggyback onto that question, how are you going to handle? all of these requests and people handling these documents, particularly like an LBJ, with all the handwritten letters, if people keep handling them over time, are they going to? They don't. They're monitored pretty carefully. We, we have uh, folks who have monitors in the, in the reading room to ensure that they're being treated with, with care. There are all, ki all kinds of rules we have to follow in terms of a clean research room. You can't bring a bag in, that type of thing. And of course, if something over time shows excessive wear, then we'd make a copy of that. So a reference copy would be used instead of the original if, if necessary. So uh, an autograph of, uh, let's say, President Bush has signed a document. What you will see is a copy of that document, not the original in our case. And uh, so that you know it's not an original, it's a copy. We will stamp on the copy that it's a copy. Uh, Oh, um, <clears throat> I've done research at the uh, Johnson Library since I was an undergraduate, uh, which was not long ago. <laughs> uh, but, and, you know, I've used the George Bush uh, Library, and I look forward to the, the W. Bush Library. Uh, my question is this, and this is this was really eye-opening. Uh, you know, if, if I go to the, uh, the Johnson Library, and this, and this is about access to the public, go to the Johnson Library, you know, the boxes are, are so that you know the average person could understand it right there by date. Uh, there's sometimes topic. Uh, you go to the uh, uh, Carter Library, and it's, it's organized much the same way. Uh, the Reagan Library, uh, the the George Bush Library, it's by serial number. And so, unless you know what you're looking for, uh, it's not as easy to find. Republicans. Uh, that, that, that's where. Of course, <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> he said Republicans. He did. <laughs> Republicans. <laughs> What's it going to be like at the George W. Bush Library? How how is the organization? I mean, again, finding aids are the are the are the best way to go about it. Our finding aids will be according to the main divisions we received, which are first of all the White House subject file, so they are by subject, and then the staff member office file, so by individual staff members. So we have it, uh, the finding aids created in that way. So. I think it'll be sure, easy to use. Robust finding aid. I mean, the Johnson Library has been around for a long time. We've got great finding aid. Yes, as robust as we can be at this stage, I believe. So we, you know, the first couple of years we're there, you try to get your arms around what do we have, right. and then you start creating these finding aids. Uh, I think we've done a good job of starting them, uh, particularly for the 200,000 pages we have open right now. Hopefully by next January we'll have it even better. But of course, we know that when the Freedom of Information Act hits next January 20th. As good of a job as we've done, I think, doing systematic review, getting ready for that, given that we have so many pages, we are just at the tip of the tip of the iceberg and trying to get ready for that. So we know there is a process you have to go through of essentially getting a queue when yeah. you submit a four-year request, and then our archivists getting to that and doing the processing they have to do. And, and, I'm sorry. I was just going to say the Freedom of Information Act is a great thing, but he processed process all his records systematically. So he started with box one, two, three, four, five. Under the FOIA, 
there could be records across different collections. So what ends up happening is you pull a folder from this record group, a folder from that record right. group. Right. It takes about four times as long to process that way. And then when a researcher sees that collection, what he's actually seeing or she is seeing is a artificial collection because that's, that's right. not the way it was created. So it's, it's very FOIA driven, but it's all changed with the Reagan Library because of the Presidential Records Act. So Mark is a deed of gift library. Everything from Reagan on is, uh, is covered by the Presidential Records Act, which fundamentally changed how we do our work. The gentleman there. Uh, my question is first directed toward uh, Director Uftergrove, and then I would appreciate the other director's comments. Can you uh, answer the question, was the LBJ School of Public Affairs President Johnson's idea? And secondly, would you comment on how that is a balancing wheel or a a facility that is, is crucial to what you do um, at the library. Uh, president Johnson wanted both uh, Presidential Library, of course, which was allowed for every president from Herbert Hoover forward through the Presidential Libraries Act of 1955. But he also wanted a, an attendant uh, school linked with it. Uh, I, I think it's a wholly complementary institution for the LBJ Library, but there would be an LBJ Presidential Library with or without an LBJ School of Public Affairs. We do a lot of academic programming in conjunction with them. They're a great resource for us, and I think vice versa. So I think that, uh, that we complement one another, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have them as a partner in my work. And we, we also do a lot of cooperation with the George Bush School of Government and Public Service. It's unique. Um, I guess we are the history, and I think President Bush sees the students at the school for him, public service is a noble calling. I was just at their graduation last week, and you've got all these great students uh, earning master's degrees and in public service. And a lot of them are going out and working for not-for-profit corporations and f as uh, and city governments and state governments. And um, uh, I think they I think they complement us and com and. Says something about President Bush that he would put a. These kids are not in it for the money. They're in it for the service. And in our case, I guess two things. One is we're trying to tie ourselves as many ways possible to SMU and see how we work with faculty and students there. We're, we're doing that. We're going to obviously now that we're actually on campus can do that even better. Secondly, the private Bush Foundation runs a Bush Institute, which is their policy institute headed by Jim Glassman. Uh, they've been doing pretty amazing work for the last couple of years in the U.S. and around the world, carrying on the president's ideas in areas like uh, uh, global health care, human freedom. They do a lot of work in education. Uh, Mrs. Bush does a lot of initiatives regarding women's rights and so forth. So a real way of the president continuing on that work he considered most important to him. We see the Bush Institute as a great partner and that the fellows can use our archives. We can do joint programming with them. Uh, we're working with them on a couple of educational initiatives that my education staff is partnering with them on. So it's kind of a ready-made partner for us right there. They're in the same building, the other side of the building that we have. Thank you. I'm interested in the, uh, the computer data that you have. There are a number of commercial uh, search engines yes. for specialized libraries like in the law right. or and then you have general things like Google and Bing. Mm -hmm. And that sort of thing. Does it, has the archives developed its own search engine for people who want to go through that electronic material, or have you piggybacked in one of the pre-existing search engines? The, the National Archives, in partnership with Lockheed Martin, created something called the Electronic Records Archive, which does have search capability. It was put together in the early 2000s, thankfully. So it gave us the way to preserve all this information and to access it. The real question I have now is how can how can we go out into the private sector and go the next step? of being able to filter some of these emails so we can process them more quickly. Uh, uh, the, the Arcos has an advisory committee called ACERA. I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's his advisory committee on electronic record archives, I think. Uh, and I, what I've really said to them is you need to start looking, I think, even more at the private sector and seeing what tools are there now or are being developed to help us filter these emails. It's somewhat heresy at the National Archives to say that a human set of human eyes isn't going to read every line of every document before you release it. We have a great responsibility to protect national security information, personal privacy information, and so forth. But at the same time, we're about access to information. My staff in a good year 
uh, they get mad at me when I say this, but can process maybe 750,000 pages to a million pages a year, maybe more in the future. Sure. But somewhere in that neighborhood, when you have over a billion pages just of emails, then you know that you have to start looking at technology as one way to help solve that problem. And I think we must be more open to looking at private sector solutions that may already exist or in the, or in the uh, pipeline right now that we can utilize. How financially self-sufficient are the libraries? Well, I'll tell you this. First of all, I think our budget uh, uh, <laughs> is still to be determined, but I think our budget of federal money per year will be between eight and nine million dollars a year, maybe a little more than that, depending on our utilities cost. We are able to uh, retain museum admissions uh, into our what's called our trust fund. That's very important for us because it does um, support many positions and programs that we do at the library. Uh, starting, uh, let's see, with your library, Warren, uh, the founding foundations that build the building and give them over to us also give us an endowment. Uh, in our case, it, it's based on 20% of the cost of the, of the facility. Uh, and that helps us pay things like utilities, custodial care, and so <coughs> forth. Uh, so we have that. And also, as directors, we are given permission to fundraise. So we can go out and say, this is a program we want to do. Uh, we're not going to look to the federal government to fund it. We're going to go out into our community or beyond and see what kind of support we can gather for this educational initiative, temporary exhibit. And then, of course, lastly, our foundations are tremendous sources of support. So oftentimes for a temporary exhibit or other things, I will turn to the Bush Foundation and say, we need your help. We don't have this money in the federal coffers, but we think this is an important program to do. We are a great private-public partnership. Right. All of our education programs, museum programs, public programs are all funded throughout outside sources. And some of my staff are funded either by the foundation, I've got a, one of my foundation people is here tonight. Uh, so they, they, we get about $800,000 a year, something like that from our foundation, plus we also get receipts from our museum. Uh, and I do a little bit of fundraising on my own. But temporary exhibits, we don't pay for. They're, they're either paid for with outside funds or with foundation funds. We are, I would say, in the federal government, probably one of the best bangs for your buck mm -hmm. that you're going to get. Mm -hmm. We are a bunch of historians. We are uh, probably as tight with a buck as <laughs> anybody you're going to find. <laughs> Would you? I, I, can, I concur. Except for, <laughs> except for the Johnson Library where they spend money like it's going. <laughs> Democrats. <laughs> Gentlemen? This question uh, initially directed towards Alan, but then some input from the others as well. And that is, how do you prioritize, you know, given the resources that you have uh, in terms of cataloging and cross-referencing and, you know, uh, identifying information that, that you know, uh, the public and researchers uh, will be made available to? Well, you know, we, we sat down very early on and tried to put together a systematic processing plan for the archives. So where do we start? And that's partly I pulled together all my archivists. Partly I work with uh, colleagues in Washington uh, looking at past experiences. Uh, partly you try to be a psychic. What will people want to know about, right? And then also you have to balance it, to be honest with you. You can say, well, people want to know about uh, this specific incident. And you know that 90% of the records from that incident are highly classified. So you can go ahead and process them, but mainly what you're going to process are withdrawal sheets uh, saying they're classified. So you, you kind of have to balance that of saying, you know, what's openable that first few years to go ahead and start processing it. But then, as Warren said earlier, everything changes next January. Because at that point, just about everything is FOIA driven what a specific person's asking for. My hope is that now I have 16 archivists on my staff total. Uh, it, my hope is that at least one or two of those people can always be systematically reviewing, going through in a systematic plan reviewing, and the other one's responding to the four-year request. That's probably a dream that won't come true. <laughs> because once you start seeing those cues get very long for requests, you want to respond to those requests, and you start pulling your resources in to do that instead. So, I mean, with the billion, you know, pages or what have you, right. how do you know how to get access to those if you haven't had, you know, the chance, or, or have you had the chance to catalog and... Well, we're able to search those emails. So if someone gives us search parameters, we're able to... That, that can be done, 
the challenge for us right now is how do you do that? How does the public do that electronically? How do we get them an electronic resource? There's no way we're ever going to print out a billion pages of emails. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a public face of the Electronic Record Archive uh, that's called Online Public Access or OPA. We love that. We love acronyms in the federal government. So OPA <laughs> is the public face of that. But to be honest with you, we're still trying to develop the tools that the archives will accept to redact electronically. So if you ask me right now, what have you processed electronically from your Electronic Records Archive? Nothing because we're waiting to get the tools that we trust are secure so that some very smart person can't come back in and unredact what we have redacted. Right? So, so that still is something that literally in the next few weeks we're supposed to receive. At that point, we'll be able to put up on that OPA what you can search in the electronic part of our archives. Last uh, question. Yeah, you alluded to, the, to what Mr. Gorbachev had said about how they don't have these in Russia. What about other countries? Uh, it seems like if there were a Thatcher or a Churchill library, I'd plan my summer vacation right now. Around well, I can, I can tell you for those two. <laughs> I can tell you for those two, if you go to Cambridge, uh, there's the great Churchill Archive Center where they have Churchill's papers and Thatcher's papers. A great place, a nice museum there. We did par uh, programs with them once with the Howard Baker Center, and we're now going to do programs with them at the Bush Library. I know over the years, different countries come in and talk to us about creating these models. I know we've talked to Egypt. Uh, we had a, a delegation in talking about a Yeltsin, Yeltsin library at one point. Uh, I don't know. I'm Mexico? sure you guys, Mexico. Mexico so, but I'm, I'm not, frankly, I'm not sure what, what um, follow-up they've done on those, uh, what's know, happened based on those conversations. Truly, the National Archives movement in the U.S. is new. Up until 1935, there was no National Archives. So, I mean, there have been German state archives, French archives, uh, English. Uh, but it is a fairly new phenomenon in the United States. And the presidential library system goes back to President Roosevelt because when the National Archives opened, President Roosevelt was the president. And up until President Roosevelt, there was no systematic means of preserving presidential papers. There, two presidents um, uh, retired to the South after their service, and their papers were burned. There are stories of uh, pre-presidential library presidents sending their papers off to be edited. The president contacts the editor. The papers have vanished or been eaten. <laughs> um, George Washington took two trunks of papers home to Mount Vernon. That's the story. And they were scattered across the country. Um, so these institutions, uh, presidential libraries, uh, are, are, are actually maybe just reaching their adulthood. And so is the National Archives. Um, it's a relatively new phenomenon in the United States, the, the National Archives. There was no history in the U.S. until after the Civil War. But what a great institution. Let's give a round of applause for the insights of this. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir.